And one of the things you talk about in, in your program is that the gray area is even with the warriors, it happened to them, just like as you're saying now, it, uh, they didn't have a choice. So my, my grandfather on the, on the other side, he was uh, a machine gunner uh that was in ukraine that that in the red army in the red army okay. yeah and they threw uh like the the statement was that there's i don't know if it's obvious or not but the rule was there's no surrender so you you better die so you i mean the, you're basically the goal was when he was fighting and he was lucky enough one of the only to survive by being wounded early on is there was a march of uh, Nazis towards, I guess, Moscow. And the whole goal in, in Ukraine was to slow every, to, to slow them into the, into the winter. I mean, I view him as such a hero and uh, he believed that he's indestructible, which is survivor bias and <laughs> that, you know, bullets can't hurt him. And that's what everybody believed. And of course, basically everyone that, uh, he quickly rose to the ranks, let's just put it this way, because everybody died. It's, 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 it was just bodies dragging these heavy machine guns, like tr always, you know, always slowly retreating, shooting and retreating, shooting and retreating. And I don't know, he was a hero to me. Like, I always, I grew up thinking that he was the one that sort of defeated the Nazis, right? And, but the reality, the, there could be another perspective, which is all of this happened to him uh, by the incompetence of Stalin, the incompet incompetence. And uh, men of uh, the Soviet Union being used like pawns in a, in a shittily played game of chess, right? So... Like the one narrative is of him as a victim, as, as you're kind of describing. And it then somehow that's more paralyzing and that's more, I don't know, it feels better to think of him as a hero and as Russia, Soviet Union saving the world. I mean, that narrative also is in the United States that uh, the that, uh, United States was key in saving the world from the Nazis. It feels like that narrative is powerful for people. I'm not sure, and I carry it still with me, but when I think about the right way to think about that war, I'm not sure if that's the correct narrative. Let me suggest something. There's a line that, uh, that a Marine named Eugene Sledge uh, had said once, and I, I keep it on my phone because it's, it's, it makes a real distinction. And he said, the front line is really where the war is. And anybody even a hundred yards behind the front line doesn't know what it's really like. Now, the difference is, is there are lots of people miles behind the front line that are in danger, right? You can be in a medical unit in the rear and you, artillery could strike you, planes could strike I mean, you. You could be in danger. But at the front line, there are two different things. One is um, that, that and, and at least, and I'm doing a lot of reading on this right now and reading a lot of veterans' accounts, James Jones, who wrote uh, uh, books like From Here to Eternity, fictional accounts of the Second World War, but he based them on his own service. He was at uh, Guadalcanal, for example, in 1942. And Jones had said that the evolution of a soldier in frontline action requires an almost surrendering to the idea that you're going to live, that you, you, you become accustomed to the idea that you're going to die. Mm -hmm. And he said, you're a different person simply for considering that thought seriously, because most of us don't. But what that allows you to do is to do that job at the front line, right? If you're too concerned about your own life, um, you, you become less of a good guy at your job, right? The other thing that the people in the one in the 100 yards at the front line do that the people in the rear medical unit really don't is you kill and you kill a lot, right? You don't just, oh, there's a sniper back here, so I shot him. It's we go from one position to another and we kill lots of people. Those things will change you. And what that tends to do, not universally, because I've read accounts from uh, Red Army soldiers and they're very patriotic, right? But a lot of that patriotism comes through years later as part of the nostalgia and the remembering. When you're down at that front 100 yards, 
it is often boiled down to a very small world. So your grandfather, was it your grandfather? Grandfather. At the machine gun, he's concerned about his position and his comrades and the people who he owes a responsibility to. And those, it's a very small world at that point. And to me, that's where the heroism is, right? He's not fighting for some giant world civilizational thing. He's fighting to save the people next to him and, and his own life at the same time because they're saving him too. And, and that there is a, a huge amount of heroism to that. And that gets to our question about force earlier. Why would you use force? Well, how about to protect these people on either side of me, right? Their lives. Um, now, is there hatred? Yeah, I hated the Germans for what they were doing. As a matter of fact, I, uh, I got a, a note from a poll not that long ago, and I have this tendency to refer to the Nazis, right? The regime that was, and he said, why do you keep calling them Nazis? He says, say, say what they were, they were Germans. And this guy wanted me to not absolve Germany by saying, oh, it was this awful group of people that took over your country. He said the Germans did this. And there's that bitterness where he says, let's not forget, you know, what they did to us and why and what we had to do back, right? Um, so for me, when we talk about these combat situations, the reason I call these people heroic is because of they're fighting to defend things we could all understand. I mean, if you come after my brother and I take a machine gun and shoot you, um, and you're going to overrun me. I mean, you're going to, that becomes a situation when we talked about counterforce earlier. Um, much easier to call yourself a hero when you're saving people or you're saving this town right behind you. And you know, if they get through your machine gun, they're going to burn these villages. They're going to throw these people out in the middle of winter, these families. That to me is a very different sort of heroism than this amorphous idea of patriotism. You know, patriotism is a thing that we often get, um, used with, right? People people manipulate us through love of country and all this because they understand that this is something we feel very strongly, but they use it against us sometimes in order to whip up a war fever or to get people. I mean, there's a great line, and I wish I could remember it in its entirety, that Hermann Goering had said about how easy it was to get the people into a war. He says, you know, you just appeal to their patriotism. I mean, there, there's buttons that you can push, and they take advantage of things like love of country and the way we um, the way we have a loyalty and an admiration to the warriors who put their lives on the line. These are manipulatable things in the human species that reliably can be counted on to move us in directions that in a more um, sober, reflective state of mind, we would consider differently. It gets the, I mean, you get this war fever up and people people wave flags and they start denouncing the enemy and they start, I mean, you know, we've seen it over and over and over again. In ancient times, this happened.